<sighs> okay, so Brittany Broski is a Texas-based influencer who went viral multiple times in 2019, notably for a video-turned-gif of her trying kombucha for the first time. No. Well... <laughs> ever since she's taken her early success and made it into a big profitable platform. She has multiple YouTube channels which rake in millions of views. She has a huge TikTok account, of course. She's been on YouTube reality shows, Discovery Plus series, and a huge Super Bowl commercial for Sabra Hummus, which now feels like unfortunate foreshadowing. Along the way, it seems like general expectations of influencers have changed a ton. In 2020, she became well known as a white American influencer who had spoken up loudly in support of the Black Lives Matter movement, sharing infographics and making TikToks in support of various forms of police abolition. When we say abolish the police, we don't mean abolish law enforcement. We mean abolish it as we know it. For this, her reputation has generally been pretty positive over the years. That was until late 2023, when she came under a little bit of fire. Since October 7th, the currently recognized state of Israel's escalation of genocidal violence against all Palestinian life has been a topic of great discussion online and offline, despite the intense suppression of media sources in the West. But Brittany Broski took a long time to post about the subject. By early November, the pressure people had put on her to make a statement with her platform had become so noticeable that she was moved to speak out, though at first not publicly. She did so at first on her close friends tab on her Instagram, sharing her frustration privately with her audience's demands. What dystopian universe do I have to address the situation in the Middle East? at the top of a podcast episode. It's, it's, it is literally the scene from inside by Bo Burnham. Who are you, wheat thins? Do you stand with the Palestinians? This seemed fairly out of character and problematic for Britney, especially because even two months prior, she had been making statements about how social media influencers should use their platforms for activism. If you can, why don't you? If you have a platform and you have people's ear, you have their attention, how dare you not? When her close friend's story leaked, folks clamored over her apparent hypocrisy, eventually motivating her to make a public apology with a statement of public support for the Palestinian people. I waited too long to, to talk about Palestine. I will admit that. Sorry, it took so long. She captioned the video, which has since amassed many millions of views. So for some reason, almost a year after this controversy has fizzled out, I want to bring it up again and analyze it. Specifically, I want to analyze what it was about in the first place. Because it seems like this discourse was revelatory of something that we've all been kind of learning on the internet over the past few years, which is that Westerners don't know shit about politics. They don't know how politics works. They don't know how to engage in politics and therefore they don't value them properly at all. I remember that when this happened, like it's been with basically every celebrity call out, there were a ton of hot takes that proliferated afterwards. I use the term hot take loosely, by the way. But it was people saying stuff like, am I the only one who thinks it's corny to ask celebrities to talk about political issues? You know how it goes. People start using the Dave Chappelle, where's Jaw, that thing. They start doing that joke over and over again as if it's original. Where is Jaw? And these takes echoed Britney's original reaction. Politics are these complicated things that happen in far off places and should only be talked about by experts and handled by politicians. God forbid. Y'all really want politicians to talk about politics? I, I don't understand that. Um, they, they do that all the time and it's, it's never good. People never like it. Now, in fact, the main angle that Britney was getting critiqued from was about her apparent hypocrisy. It wasn't the fact that she was popular and didn't speak out. It was that she was popular, had a reputation for speaking out that brought her a lot of positive attention. And then when it made her uncomfortable suddenly to speak out, she didn't. I think this is a very fair critique, which ignites something in the human soul, a desire for authenticity and consistency, a modern disdain for fake activism. But I'm here to tell you that that critique is only part of the problem. In fact, there's a much bigger and more important issue, one that we, the upper class, the educated, employed, social media inhabiting global north, the ones who get all of our takes from YouTube videos and highly upvoted Reddit posts, 
need to focus on immediately. This is a story of us not understanding solidarity. One of the most highly circulated clips used to demonstrate how Brittany Broski was a hypocrite featured her talking about solidarity in a clip that I want you to pay close attention to. Solidarity costs nothing. Solidarity costs you nothing. Think about that. Solidarity costs nothing. I want you to pay attention to that rhetoric. This is what she uses to tell folks to step forward, to speak up. It's the rhetoric which ultimately called her to address her own controversy, the one that people were constantly using to justify their critique of her, that they were bringing that wording forward in order to say how bad it was that she wasn't speaking about Palestine. It's one thing to ask a celebrity to give a dissertation about capitalism or geopolitics. We don't want that. We just want a celebrity to stand in solidarity. That shouldn't be so hard, right? Well, I want to push back on that idea a little bit in this video. I want to, in fact, posit the opposite. Solidarity is supposed to be hard. True solidarity costs something. It's supposed to cost you something. And the idea that it doesn't or shouldn't is part of a complete brainwashing of global northerners, part of a focus on depoliticization over all else. It's an erasure of the sacrifice required to do any good political work, to build any kind of livable world. To do this, we're going to have to ask the hard questions. What is solidarity? How do we actually do it? And why should we? Because so much of our solidarity is immaterial or about things that are not heavily controversial necessarily. And so it doesn't really feel like you have to lose something in order to stand with um, like women in states where abortion is illegal now. But for instance, if you are a social worker in Texas or a teacher in Florida, standing with uh, trans kids might actually require you to lose a lot. And that's just sort of what you have to risk in order to be in solidarity in those situations. So let's start by talking about another old social media controversy. I'm sorry, this script is kind of old, or at least I started it a while ago, and I've been working on it for a while, on and off, trying to figure out how to get this message across. And the thing about the social media world, it moves really fast. Y'all remember who Hope Woodard is? Right. I want to talk about a controversial TikTok from the end of last year by creator Hope Woodard. Woodard, who was criticized for appearing in a Starbucks ad just prior, despite being vocally pro-Palestine. Supporters of the Palestinian cause, in case you don't know, have taken to boycotting Starbucks in response to the company's legally threatening repression of its union's pro-Palestine statement. Attempting to address the initial backlash she received over being in this ad, Woodard only kind of made things worse. She's even taken the TikTok down since then, of course, but thankfully, we have a word-for-word reenactment from TikToker Sarah Rule in its place. So here's how it goes. Y'all are going to see me in an ad. And I signed that ad before I knew we were boycotting. Hope starts by saying she signed to do the Starbucks ad before we started boycotting. She then describes going to Krispy Kreme at an airport as well as doing other alternatives to going to Starbucks. Hope starts to describe how the situation unfolds, repeating that she signed the deal before the boycott. She describes with pained expression how she wasn't going to send in the content the night she found out about the boycott, but sent it in anyway feeling that she needed the money. Hope says that she always has a choice though, which again suggests that she admits fault and that the viewer can do what they wish from that information. Hope then begins to raise some sort of discussion, starting by giving an anecdote of seeing Planned Parenthood workers enter a room with a big Starbucks order for their lunch break, saying that, Ooh, the internet would be pretty mad about that. Hope opines that it is valid to be mad to some degree if people know about the boycott and still go to Starbucks, and then brings the seemingly unrelated point that these Planned Parenthood workers are doing so much good for the community, right? They're already doing so much good for the world. 
Hope continues that these hard workers are doing what they need to do to get through the day, and that she wishes everyone had the same capacity to boycott, suggesting that she feels the online left is too harsh in their calls for praxis. She brings up another friend who does community action and doesn't have the time or access to go online and learn about these kinds of actions. As she does this, Hope seems to further distance herself from a position of solidarity by referring to it as what the left feels is correct rather than assert that she herself thinks that it's correct. She brings the conversation back to her situation, saying again that she takes full responsibility for her action, yet also couching her action in justification, reiterating that, to be clear, she said yes before the boycott and went through with it after finding out because she needed to make rent. This brings her to a conclusion where she strikes back at people acting like she's the enemy and says that even though she made a choice that is not in alignment with the movement and what we're trying to do and that she's sorry for it, she at the same time had to make the choice she made, still supports the movement and that in a telling final statement, sometimes reality takes precedent. Reality. Okay. The first thing I want to address about Hope's spiel is the emphasis on individuality, on goodness and badness, in conversations about acting in solidarity. When she emphasizes that she is not the enemy and still supports the cause, despite acting against it, when she cites examples of Planned Parenthood workers who are already doing so much good, she engages us in a measurement of individual goodness and badness. So I'm going to say that these ideas take up way too much space in our political conversations, in part because of how capitalism, especially in the neoliberal era, has worked to eradicate and demonize ideas of collective actors in a unified society, in favor instead of an idea of society as a nebulous entity, often that acts in poor taste and with bad opinions, loosely grouped together under the banner of a state comprising of individuals who are meant to be judged for their individuation, only bonded socially to their families. So I'm going to talk about neoliberalism. Chile, 1973. Everything seems to come back here. The story has been well told. An historic movement electing a democratic socialist, Salvador Allende, to lead Chile, chosen by the people to sufficiently improve conditions for the country's working class. He didn't get the chance. Beginning with the 1970 kidnapping and murder of military chief René Schneider, who refused to use the Chilean army to prevent Allende's election, the CIA was consistently present in supporting a violent coup d'etat. Here is where many say we get the birth of neoliberalism in ideation and action. As David Harvey writes in A Brief History of Neoliberalism, the coup against the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende was promoted by domestic business elites, threatened by Allende's drive towards socialism. It was backed by U.S. corporations, the CIA, and U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. It violently repressed all the social movements and political organizations of the left and dismantled all forms of popular organization, such as the community health centers in poorer neighborhoods. The labor market was freed from regulatory or institutional restraints, trade union power for example. But how was the stalled economy to be revived? The policies of import substitution, fostering national industries by subsidies or tariff protections that had dominated Latin American attempts at economic development had fallen into disrepute, particularly in Chile, where they had never worked that well. With the whole world in economic recession, a new approach was called for. Neoliberalism is a complicated term associated with right-wing movements in the late 20th century. Harvey defines it as a theory of political economic practices that proposes that human well-being can best be advanced by liberating individual entrepreneurial freedoms and skills within an institutional framework characterized by strong private property rights, free markets, and free trade. Markets, of course, are hardly as free as advertised, especially when unregulated. They work to favor the participants with the most resources, and vast amounts of resources cannot be acquired by one party without stealing and exploiting others. In the case of Chile, the violent coup that ended its leftward push became the perfect grounds for neoliberal economic policy. Let's fix this wayward country by showing them what real economic freedom is like. 
the result was the era of Augusto Pinochet, one of the most violent and oppressive rulers of the late 20th century or the 20th century entirely, which is no small feat. Pinochet instituted sweeping neoliberal reforms under the tutelage of the Chicago Boys, a group of US educated Chilean economists who happened to be at the cutting edge of neoliberal thought at the very time when their home country was making a huge right wing shift. All left wing organizations had been destroyed. Even those who were mildly affiliated with such politics were tried and killed often. Many were exiled, resistance was neutered, and as such, here came the reforms. Pinochet denationalized private companies and resources, natural resources were radically undertaken as private profit sources, social security was privatized, and so on and so on. Now, how successful was neoliberal economic policy in its potential best situation when it got its first crack in a country with no meaningful opposition and complete mandate over fiscal policy? It was not very successful. Brief surges in popular economic indicators like GDP soon fell to the wayside when Chile hit a drastic monetary crisis in 1982. But any reports of the Chilean miracle that happened before and after the monetary crisis can be explained neatly by pointing out the equivalent surge of income inequality which coincided with the country's economic growth. Put simply, Chile became richer through neoliberalism because a bunch of people got really rich and everybody else got really poor. This has been the case with every neoliberal project since, with Chile's project being seen as an ideal. For instance, in the case of the US, Harvey writes, after the implementation of neoliberal policies in the late 1970s, the share of national income of the top 1% of income earners in the US soared to reach 15%, very close to its pre-Second World War share, by the end of the century. The top 0.1% of income earners in the US increased their share of the national income from 2% in 1978 to over 6% in 1999, while the ratio of the median compensation of workers to the salaries of CEOs increased from just over 30 to 1 in 1970 to nearly 500 to 1 by 2000. In order to force this kind of inequality and to push the narrative that it's a success somehow, you have to be able to coerce people. In Chile, the coercion was as brutal and simple as it gets. You throw people in jail, kill them, exile people, all that stuff. But you can't really do that in imperial countries, right? You can't do that in the US or the UK. Too much money there, too much at stake in terms of domestic popularity. You can't really make people divert their attention from what's going on in front of them in the streets like they can when it comes to countries in other parts of the world. And so ideology becomes the main weapon used for coercion, the main way to get people to do what you want by convincing them that it's what's best for them. Reagan in the US and Thatcher in the UK both appealed to working classes without invoking class power. They did so by focusing on the individual, the individual's morality, the individual's choices. After all, this is the great appeal of neoliberal thought. Individuals needed to operate freely in the market for the world to be organized fairly. Where politicians of the past had to appeal to the society that existed in front of them, which was united through different social and cultural and economic interests, neoliberal politicians instead sought to fracture society as much as possible. Now that's not necessarily something new, divide and conquer of course was the UK's signature in imperialism, but through neoliberalism the difference is you convince everybody that each of them have the chance and the freedom to do great and to be on top as long as they stop thinking of themselves as workers and started thinking of themselves as bosses or bosses to be temporarily embarrassed millionaires. Now, what has this got to do with solidarity? Nathan DeFord, writing as Rochelle DeFord in their 2022 book, Solidarity in Conflict, A Democratic Theory, notes how solidarity is based in building and maintaining society. They write that society exists where individuals recognize that they need to be transformed away from a sole focus on the individual and her rational maximization of self-interest. I had a chance to speak with DeFord in the making of this video. Nathan DeVord, uh, is a pleasure to speak with you. I'm glad to be here also and talk to you. I am a political philosopher. Um, right now I work at Smith College. I'm an assistant professor. And I wrote a book on solidarity, specifically about the ways that solidarity acts for people who engage in organizations that you could call like solidarity organizations. So it looks at things like Black Lives Matter or specific unions and says, what does solidarity look like from the inside of these 
rather than from like the outside perspective looking in, Mm -hmm. which is generally the sort of academic perspective that you get is like, oh, I'm outside these groups and I want to understand them rather than what is, what are the people within them experiencing? How do they see their politics? How do they see the disagreements they have or their Mm. goals or Mm. things like that? Borrowing from political theorist Wendy Brown, DeFord finds that neoliberal thought and policy have been key in eradicating society. At one point, Margaret Thatcher even declared that there is no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. What a dystopic thing to say, right? But this wasn't just Margaret Thatcher being blackpilled all of a sudden. It had a purpose. This is a neoliberal presentation of a new form of freedom. Now, as socialist thought becomes more and more popular on social media, constant bickering and infighting over theoretical conversations seem to root back to an obsession with individual merit and integrity. And this is at the core of Hope Woodard's point about Planned Parenthood, and Brittany Broski's points about expectations of individual celebrities. Instead of focusing on everyone in a group working to achieve a goal, we focus on different individuals and whether things are perfectly free and fair for them. Whether each person in the group is in the best position to do the group action. What if one person needs to make rent? What if one person needs to work at Planned Parenthood? Or as one concerned Twitter user asked, if Starbucks is the only place open and I'm hungry, do y'all want me to starve? Genuinely let me know. Let's put aside for a second the absurd hypotheticals, the fact that you're probably not starving if you're a anywhere near well-to-do person in the first world, the fact that Starbucks is basically never the only place open, especially for food, the reality that there are many ways to make rent and drink coffee. This fixation with returning to exaggerated examples that don't have to do with any real contemporary thing going on, but instead just draw on hypotheticals that might infringe on the individual and their freedom to choose is exactly the kind of thing that Thatcher and her ilk have fomented in our thought processes. It's the same way that people (laughs) argue with vegans because they're like, what if one day I'm stranded on an island and the only thing I could eat is a pig? You know, it's, it's like, okay. Earlier this year, I had a moment where a friend and I wanted to go on a flight and we saw how much it cost to pay for a refundable ticket and thought to ourselves, you know, if we get sick, if we get COVID, like many people still are doing, by the way, maybe we could just wear good masks and hop on the flight and nobody will notice. And we watched the socialism leave our bodies in real time because suddenly it was not about practical things that could help the society around us. We were just thinking about, well, what about our desire to do a thing? What about us as individuals? Don't we just get the right to just choose? You know, it's quick. It's real quick. Sometimes you forget that other people's health and well-being is more important than your individual desire to travel to exactly where you want to, exactly when you want to. Kind of absurd, but that's where we're at. I think this way of thinking is to some degree natural, but it goes to such extremes so easily because of our environment. The refundable ticket being that expensive is not a natural design. That's something that airlines can just do because of neoliberalism and capitalism. People with money know that you will care about your individual feelings, let alone your well-being, over other people's is all the time, especially if society becomes weaker and weaker, harder to organize, harder to reach out to in your time of need. This is why they continue to jack up prices for their services and products, and why it's continuously harder to afford a place to live. You should check out Clara Matei's book, The Capital Order. It talks about liberalism and fascism, and it's pretty relevant. So remember that weird black pill quote from Thatcher from earlier? DeFord writes, Thatcher denies that society exists in order to defray a demand that any individual might make upon the collective social or political body. It becomes an individual's responsibility to ensure that their needs are met, their rights are secured, that their life goes well. There is indeed something anti-society about upholding the individual above all, about being wholly concerned with the individual's duties to solidary groups or with the individual moral claims a call to solidarity might impose. It costs you nothing to do solidarity. What's wrong with the individual and their morality if they don't do that little bit, that little tiny bit, 
to be in solidarity. The insistence on calling for individual liberties at the expense of collective well-being is very often a false dichotomy. Neoliberalism, our countries, our rules, only protect your individuation as long as you do what they want. It obscures the fact that without society, the individual has nothing. You don't have roads to walk on because what society paved them? You don't have Chapel Roan albums to scream at the top of your lungs because what queer culture do you have without society? The individual and the collective exist, everyone say it with me, dialectically. Despite the insistence on one or the other, real solidarity is very often the best thing for individuals. To prove this concept, that solidarity is good for the individual in ways that individualism can't be, we should dive into that ever so sticky topic of identity politics that people keep having fake arguments about. For instance, there's a resurgence of basic socialist ideas online that often lead to there being a lot of misinterpretation, things being talked about with, you'll see what I mean. Class war and unionization are described as bottom line political causes, which should take precedence over supposedly superfluous things like your pronouns, gender, your race, sexuality. What they don't tell you is that all of these battles are interlinked. Cases in which activists fight for one in spite of the other or against the other are always ineffective and problematic. See JK Rowling, etc., etc. Not even just for overall equality, but for the rights that you're trying to fight for. It's not like JK Rowling has done a ton for women's liberation. Let's say that. To talk about what real solidarity is and how it works, we should discuss a historical example. In Solidarity in Conflict, DeFord notes the case of LGBTQ rights in Canada, which were truly won through labor movement struggles rather than in the sphere of public debate. An easy contrast between the current status of LGBT rights and protections in the United States and in Canada is illuminating. The Canadian Human Rights Act CHRA, was modified in 1996 to explicitly prohibit discrimination in employment, public access, and housing on the basis of sexual orientation. Though it took about a decade for Canada to legalize same-sex marriage after the amendment of the CHRA here, Former labor rights and rights to the content of public life preceded rights to marriage and partnership benefits. In fact, despite the lack of access to legally recognized romantic relationships, Canadian union members frequently won lawsuits and grievances after their partners were denied benefits such as health insurance coverage and reimbursements. The presence of stronger protections for LGBT people in Canada, in part, attribute to a more vibrant workers' movement than in the United States. Labor solidarity played a role in a number of lawsuits for the rights of gay and lesbian Canadians to equal protections under law. The piecemeal protections won by labor unions, dating back to at least the 1960s, formed bedrock on which the wholesale legal protections for LGBT Canadians could be achieved. Labor solidarity achieved gains across a swath of issues for all LGBT Canadians, not merely those who were members of labor unions. In fact, this was often an explicit goal of union organizing in Canada. While labor organization may be construed as a whole issue unto itself that could only cross over with LGBT rights through efforts of intersectionality, the reality is that any movement serious about securing the rights of a marginalized and or exploited group is going to make gains for people of all different identities. For one, abstractly, you don't have workers' rights if you don't have gay workers' rights. Discriminatory laws are a danger to all people. For instance, all someone has to do if they want to take your workers' rights away, if there are no gay workers' rights, is to prove somehow, subjectively, that you are gay or might be gay. And that's enough. And people can point at other examples of identities whose rights have been taken away from them as precedent for why yours should be taken away. DeFord is clear that the efforts made to fight for these groups extended beyond unionists being open-minded good people. This understanding that legalized discrimination towards one group is dangerous for all has been enough historically to motivate people to fight against it, even if they themselves are bigoted towards such groups. These efforts weren't just about securing rights for one particular group of people in the workforce. As the Canadian Labour Congress articulated in their statement on the matter, the labour movement can and should play a key role in the achievement of lesbian, gay, and bisexual rights. 
This is an integral part of the new approach to unionism, which is essential if we are to survive as a vital force in society. And though some definitely benefit more than others, the results have been absolutely beneficial for all individual LGBTQ plus people in Canada. Not only did this labor movement ensure legal protection against discrimination, but it also paved the way for changes at the federal level. DeFord writes, in determining that it ought to concern itself with the protection of LGB people in the workplace, the CLC did not merely set its sights on ameliorating the damaging ways LGB people are treated within the workplace. They also set up lobbying efforts at different levels of government in order to agitate for better LGB protections nationwide. Oppression is necessarily interlinked. It's all oppression, okay? The person that does bad stuff to one group of people they're probably doing bad stuff to everybody else too. A recent example of imperial countries, for instance, collaborating to take advantage of and to violently oppress marginalized groups is the usage of Israeli surveillance system Pegasus by other governments, notably in India, to suppress dissidents. Cases like these illustrate to us how a robust pro-Palestine movement has positive implications for oppressed people around the world. But in order for solidarity movements to have a real impact, they have to go beyond mere opinionation and argumentation. They have to actually do stuff. And the stuff they do, whether they be Starbucks boycotts or forms of direct action, will necessarily be controversial, especially in places like the US where basically everything is trying to teach you not to do good stuff for other people. It's going to be controversial when a bunch of people push to do good stuff. I don't want to use too basic language, but I don't want to be too jargony either, so forgive me for the good stuff, bad stuff I keep saying. What I call stuff here is what DuFord terms strategic action. That being things which solidarity groups decide on in a space of democratic contestation so that the organization can determine for itself that it has normatively good aims and politically effective tactics before it takes strategic action in the wider world. However, once those strategic actions are taken, they are necessarily unresponsive to debate in the public sphere. Strategic action does not care for the objections of others. Strategic action does not care for the objections of others, for coming to an understanding, or for getting the question at hand right. It cares for the attainment of its goals, often, as the saying goes, by any means necessary. This gets at the heart of one of the core problems with Hope's TikTok, with Brittany Broski's issue. It's the inability to deal with conflict, and the suggestion that conflict in and of itself represents a problem to be addressed. In reality, conflict and infighting are necessary. They're important parts of solidarity. And the go. Ella Baker, often referred to as the mother of the civil rights movement, was an activist from Virginia whose insights and actions were hugely influential to causes of women's rights and youth rights. From the late 40s onward, she fought Jim Crow laws, she organized in multiple different groups, she ran a voter registration campaign, and she was key to ushering in student activists. She also had several conflicts with Martin Luther King Jr. Chapter 6 of Barbara Ransby's book Ella Baker and the Black Freedom Movement, titled The Preacher and the Organizer, details how Baker began having serious issues with different aspects of King's leadership from the late 50s, when she began working in his Southern Christian Leadership Conference. She, like the rest of America, was impressed by his candor, his charisma, and his conviction as an advocate of the burgeoning Montgomery boycott movements. Ransby writes that King's sudden fame did not sit right with Baker, especially given his youth and inexperience. Moreover, he did not seem to want to learn about the process of organizing, at least not from her. While King's closest advocates Bayard Rustin and Stanley David Levison had close relationships themselves with Baker, King kept her at arm's length, which was not unusual in her overall experience. According to Ransby, her forthrightness in the face of authority carried a certain price, limiting her acceptance by those in positions of official power, but it was a price she was willing to pay in order to think and act according to her conscience. Perhaps Baker's central qualm with King came from a fundamental question in organizing overall. Baker believed in grassroots organizing, in movements emerging from the ground up. King was, by her account, interested to some degree in the advancement of his career and in leading a movement from the top down. Baker had several problems with King's SCLC. 
first with its lack of involvement of women in leadership roles, joking at one point about her contributions by saying someone's got to run the mimographing machine, second with its focus on access to the ballot box and dignified treatment in public accommodations, which, dressed in respectability politics, found the organization a world apart from the lives of destitute sharecroppers and their families who constituted a considerable portion of the South's black population. People who could barely afford the fare to ride on public transportation even after desegregation. It was this group that Baker worried most about. The issue of misogyny in late 50s organizing was perhaps the greatest issue which Baker found herself in conflict with at the time. Despite her consistently crucial contributions to organizing events, she was never considered for a position of leadership, and her point of view was constantly marginalized. Rainsby writes, the work that Ella Baker and other women did for the SCLC was consistently undervalued. As the organization grew and additional female staffers were hired, Baker protested that these women were taken for granted and treated unfairly as well. A rhetoric of racial equality marked the public pronouncements of the SCLC leaders, while old hierarchies based on gender inequalities endured within their ranks. Baker refused to accept the situation in silence. She criticized ministerial leaders who came to meetings late and left early, disregarding the inconvenience they caused for female clerical staff. They expected the women workers to cater to them. Baker complained. Although she never publicly named names, Baker also alluded to unprincipled sexual behavior on the part of some male ministers involved in the movement. She confided to one researcher that certain SCLC ministers would come into the office in the afternoon after spending the morning at some sister's house doing what they shouldn't have been doing. You see, I know too many stories. The minister's arrogant assumption that they stood above the moral rules they preached to others cost them Baker's respect as ministers and as men. This underscored Baker's continuing frustration with King's cult of personality. At one point during an event by the Montgomery Improvement Association Institute on Nonviolence focusing on praising King's works, she asked King directly why he allowed such hero worship and he responded simply that it was what people wanted. This answer did not satisfy Baker in the least. Baker felt that SCLC's increasing reliance on King's celebrity and charisma had all sorts of hidden dangers. Less polished leaders were likely to receive less recognition and might become disaffected from the struggle. Baker's well-documented rifts with King, however fair or unfair you might think her gripes are, were key parts of a hugely important solidarity movement that achieved obviously very important things for equality in the United States. Her critiques of him, her disillusion with the SCLC movement in the late 50s, led to her eventually fracturing off after having formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which metastasized and empowered key direct actions by students in the civil rights movement, including the famous sit-in. Now, strip this of context, if we were to go by a popular wisdom, by the way Redditors talk about things these days, you would think this is a bad thing. Baker was unable to work in in unison with the solidarity movement, unable to reconcile differences, and ultimately fractured it. These days, people get criticized for criticizing anybody. You get pushback for telling political bands like Rise Against that they should do commentary on Gaza because they've based their entire image and ethos on being political activists who are anti-war. And then their fans will jump you on Reddit and say, you're selfish. They don't have to comment on everything political just because they're a political band. They don't have to do anything that they don't want to do. Which is like, okay, and then I can criticize them. People will criticize No Name, the rapper, for criticizing J. Cole's politics in the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement. Imagine somebody criticizing Martin Luther King Jr. What would have happened to a black woman in that position? Imagine the YouTube takes you would have seen, the shorts, the TikToks. The reality is the tension she brought to MLK's leadership was crucial in making gains for the civil rights movement. Her dissuasion helped her build one of the key organizations of the movement which brought far more women to the forefront, and thus their key insights and leadership roles, rather than as peripheral tools used to fill in gaps made by chauvinistic male leaders. Her work had a key impact on King himself in that way. Without the SNCC, there is no 1963 Civil Rights March on Washington, an event which, fittingly, has been remembered to this day for King's I Have a Dream speech. No Baker, no Dream. DeFord's book centers on the point that solidarity functions in its most democratic way when it is open to conflict. This contradicts common narratives that conflict within a movement represents an issue. And that comes from this 
concept of liberal consensus building that has become a norm of our ideology. You got to reach a consensus. Everybody has to come to an agreement. If some people are not in agreement, then that's a problem. There's fracturing. In today's climate, we see this kind of fixation in conversations about action toward the Zionist entity. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israeli products is criminalized by the United States and considered antagonistic by U.S. culture. Blocking off bridges, as activists are doing in New York City and London, is seen as problematic. After all, if you're gonna make somebody's commute to work harder, you're gonna make somebody's life harder, and then how will they listen to you? How will you get them on your side? Everybody on Reddit thinks this is a checkmate point. They think this is the most important thing. Well, people aren't gonna be on your side if you make their life difficult. The, the response is that this is not the goal. While there should be effort in the movement from some people, to change hearts and minds. The strategic actions of that movement cannot be focused on popularity, on public opinion. The goal is to push people to do what you need them to do, whether they like it or not. Neoliberalism has you thinking this is equivalent to authoritarianism. This is the I am very smart horseshoe theory thing people do. It's, it's equivalent to Donald Trump if you make people do things that make them uncomfortable without them saying they want to do it first. That that's just too violating to each person's individual agency to justify doing something like, I don't know, saving lives of children or the planet. Sadly, this is the only way shit gets done. The civil rights movement constantly pulled negatively with white people in America. Don't try to rewrite history, we have the evidence. It persisted regardless, it had major victories, and now everybody looks back and says, yeah, that was a great thing that they did. They were so brave. Brave because of what? Brave because of what? If everybody wanted it to happen, why was it so brave for them to do that? The same is going to be done of these pro-Palestinian actions and environmentalist actions. I guarantee you this. People speak glowingly now of the fucking Unabomber, for God's sake. They're going to be positive about student protests. They generally always are. Beyond the public, however, there is a need for conflict within the internal democratic processes of solidarity movements. The processes which take place prior to an agreement on a strategic action. Ella Baker was constantly useful in coordinating strategic action to the point of being seen as a crucial organizer. This did not stop her from constantly calling people out within the movement, including its face. This is not because humans are naturally conflictual, never get along, never happy. It is because solidary movements are democratic. They represent small realms of democracy within states that are actually anti-democratic. Like the US, which purports to have a federal democracy, but in actuality holds a presidential election every four years between two parties, always the two parties, that are backed by the same corporate donors, and which always run two candidates that are extremely unpopular. Two candidates who will preside basically the same on foreign policy and mostly the same on domestic policy too. And then they have all this gerrymandering shit to make it harder and harder for people to vote so they can't even get that right. To be clear, DeFore doesn't advocate for any type of conflict being fomented in order to keep a movement spicy. They use the term substantive conflicts to refer to ones like Baker's. They are not quarrels of personality because one person simply dislikes another, nor are they disagreements about elements of our lives that have little practical effect, such as the choice of what to watch on television. Substantive conflicts are conflicts over elements of the world that affect our lives in serious and thoroughgoing ways. Here's how you can spot a liberal. Whenever they get criticized by people within their movement, even for things that are quite fair, they say that this is the problem with the movement, that this is the reason democracy is eroded because people can't get along. They can't just meet each other eye to eye because of their differences. In fact, it's the opposite. Democracy needs conflict to survive. Of course, there are conversations to be had about how we have this conflict. I think it's actually the fact that we're so allergic to conflict, the fact that we're so afraid of being in conflict, that when it occurs, we're constantly extremely, extremely insulting and uncharitable, and at the point of simply wanting nothing to do with people who we have conflict with, because we haven't been taught that conflict is necessary, it's important, it's part of life, and that it's okay to work with people who we have conflict with. And so people being too conflictual is not the problem at all. This is because we live in a non-ideal world. 
That's DeFord's term. If most of the population of America are being screwed over, there must be a conflict towards securing their rights. If some sort of consensus is achieved that everything is fine and we should all just get along despite the state of things, then there is no democracy. That's the irony of it. As DeFord says, the decision that a conflict ought to be eliminated or left unagitated serves here as a form of authoritarianism. It fails to consider that something real may be at stake in the conflict, and so concludes that the agitators ought to be excluded. Hope Woodard's situation is a form of authoritarianism, masking itself as substantive conflict. Woodard not only fractures with the strategic action of the Solidarity Group for the sake of paying her own rent, she is subtly advocating against it, meaning she has positioned herself against it. When folks called her out for that, she purported that they are the ones with unsubstantive conflict. They're just being mean. They're saying she's the enemy when she's on their side. In reality, she's extolling the virtues of a liberal consensus and demeaning the importance of strategic action. In 1964, a white American in her position would be pleading for protesters to be reasonable, to stop demanding direct action from people who agree with what they want, but have to pay the bills. She's against the movement because it's too conflictive. That being, she's against the movement because it's democratic, because it's embodying solidarity. And this is the thing about solidarity. It's supposed to be hard. You're supposed to be called out. You're supposed to have to reflect on whether those call outs are substantive or based on personal gripes. You need to constantly think about who you're excluding, and at the same time, be in support of the strategic action of the solidarity group, even if safely supporting from a distance. If you're not doing that, then what is it you're actually doing? I started writing this video almost a year ago. And you can probably tell because basically all of the social media stories I'm touching on are quite dated now. The speed with which celebrities and influencers run headfirst into bad solidarity is staggering, to the point where recalling events that happened over three months ago feels like archaeology. Take for example a controversial TikTok by the creator Mario Morante, which I can hear you now asking, who is Mario Morante? I'm not sure. Okay, he's some famous content creator guy. Is that good enough for you? Essentially, Mirante had the same qualms that Brittany Broski expressed in her private Instagram story. It's your duty, it's your responsibility as an influencer with a large platform, a huge following to talk about these very serious world issues. No, it's not. And I won't. Influencers aren't experts. They shouldn't be looked at to make comments on complicated issues like when one country kills hundreds of thousands of innocent people in another country. I had intended to add it to the video when planning to publish it over the summer. That didn't happen. And now I'm looking at it like, shit. I don't, I don't know if it's just going in the video anymore. What I might do is change the thumbnail every so often so that it incorporates pictures of new controversies that also fit in this category. Please feel free in the comment section to add your own accounts of things you saw that are like these situations. Influencers being bad at solidarity. I'm always open to listen, and I love the tea. That said, there's a reaction of defensiveness that pervades when people call for political action in the United States and other Western countries. Talk about Gaza, but I'm just a YouTuber. Don't work with Starbucks, but I need to make money. Don't go to Starbucks, but I like their coffee. In response, it's easy to say, get over yourself, right? But sometimes the conflicts are deeper. What if I do live in a food desert and I'm not very rich and I need to eat and this is the only reasonable place to get food? while I'm at work? What if I could use the sponsorship money so that I could pay rent? What if I need the bridge to be open to go to work? Or I might get fired. If neoliberals hadn't killed society, a lot of these concerns would have been more easily addressed. Solidarity is, as DeFord writes, a way of building sociality in a world that insists on atomization and individuality. Individual concerns can be addressed when situated in a cooperating society. One piece of propaganda that Google generously disseminates is the idea that activists prevent medical vehicles from crossing bridges. This was cited in smearing Just Stop Oil's campaign in the UK. A story gained traction stating that the group's bridge protest had prevented an ambulance from getting through. In reality, 
it was the police that stopped the ambulance from getting through. The group shot back on Twitter. Show the whole photo. Protesters are on the right-hand side of the photo, walking north. It's your officers blocking the ambulance. This is in line with protesters' blue light policy. Look it up. It's very easy to look up. Surely this response by Just Stop Oil on Twitter got a ton of applause and ended the argument and everybody was like, ha ha, you guys, the police are bad. The Met police responded tellingly. The bridge is blocked because your activists are laying in the road, as your video shows. If the people who are under arrest worked with us, got up and moved to the pavement, we could have reopened the road to release the traffic. Just Stop Oil was ratioed, meaning that they were wrong and bad. In actuality, that's nonsense. The Met police and the many who have sided with them in this debate have decided that yes, it is acceptable for us to kill people in ambulances in order to stop people from doing protests we don't like. And the only ones to blame are the victims, the activists, who are trying to stop an overall crisis that was causing them to be there in the first place. I had to kill this person. You wouldn't cooperate. The majority of people seem to agree with this shit. If you just hadn't raised a fuss, caused disorder, then the ambulance would have gotten through. This is what happens when you disrupt order. Please stop. Many months ago, people in my very own community posts left comments basically decrying protesters for making it hard for them to get to class on time. Aww. Frequently, a neutral, innocent victim is cited in a far off example in order to make the activists look immoral, to render the direct action irrational. But these neutral innocent victims, where that term even fits the bill, are victimized by the world they live in, the state, the people who do evil shit, not the protesters trying to stop the people who do evil shit. The police blocked the ambulance, not the protesters. Facts don't care about your feelings. Let's get back to the Hope Woodard situation, the Starbucks one, if you recall. Amidst the controversy, a fellow TikTok user brought attention to her family's origins. Okay, so she blocked me, but I have a question for Hope Woodard and potentially a challenge for her to get out of her comfort zone, depending on the answer. Her father being a diamond seller who works with an Israeli company, the diamonds themselves being sourced from highly exploitative labor. As it turns out, her socioeconomic background has significance here. Her family's material interests go against pro-Palestine movements. But even if it were the case that, for instance, she didn't have a great relationship with her father and is actually trying to make money aside from the family and that's why it's extra important that she get these sponsorship deals even if they come from Starbucks. In that case, what is to be done with her rent? How do people pay their rent without contributing to boycotted corporations? So there's actually examples uh, here of people who understand the cost of solidarity and who work it out. In January of this year, I agreed to do music curation work for a company based in the place that we don't really like right now. I did not know about the conflict to the extent that I understand it now. When I got the offer for this curation work, I had been living off of a credit card for the entire month and a friend had to help me with rent. That's how little money I had and the curation work was paid. In October, when we came to a collective deeper understanding and awakening to a conflict that is decades long, I had to take responsibility for what I didn't know at the time when I didn't know it. I reached out to the company that I had at that point agreed to do curation work for, for an entire year. And I told them that I didn't wanna be on their platform anymore and I was very specific about the reason I named that the reason was in boycott. They agreed to disaffiliate me with the platform and to take down the work that I had done for them so far, so long as I paid them back the entirety of what they paid me throughout the course of the year. I pushed back, uncomfortable, knowing that I couldn't afford it. I was standing my ground on the reason why I was disaffiliating myself from the platform in the first place. When they got even a whiff of oh she's not finna pay us back they threatened to sue me it was scary and i didn't know what to do and i couldn't afford to pay them that money back but i paid them that money back the choices part of this is the most important part i'm not going to speak to the validity of whether or not this person could or could not afford to take this brand deal to submit that content to get paid on the back end but what they did have was the choice to go back to the email thread where they were going back and forth about their brand deal and speak forthrightly about the reason why they did not want to go through with that brand deal anymore. 
not just for the sake of their audience, but also for the sake of their own integrity. And they didn't do it. And that's where you hold yourself accountable on your platform. That's where you apologize. That's where it starts with, I couldn't afford to do it. And I didn't know what I didn't know at the time that I didn't know it. And now I know, and it won't happen again. But I don't want to be too acerbic here. Precarity is precarity, and ultimately, her decision is hard to judge from a moral standpoint. How many of us would have turned down the money? And this is partly yet another indication of how individual moralism is a very incomplete lens through which one can judge these issues. As much as we can yell at her to get a job and get a backbone, that's not really going to get the point across, and it's focusing too much on her as some sort of individual moral actor and not on what's going on in the big picture here. Instead, we should highlight how being part of a society, as is a necessary process of solidarity, opens up new avenues for a person to take care of their individual interests. Especially as someone with a large TikTok platform, Hope could have, for instance, let people know on TikTok what happened in the situation and say, hey, it's going to be hard for me to make rent in this case. I'm going to put my Venmo or my Ko-Fi in the description and you let me know. Is it Ko-Fi? I think it's pronounced Ko-Fi. Coffee? I'm going to put a link in the description to donate. And with the platform she has, she could have possibly raised a lot of money, especially from people who saw that video in the algorithm and wanted to support somebody doing something noble. Creators do this all the time, and maybe they should do it more often, even if it is derided as some form of e-begging. It is essentially mutual aid in that situation because you're making yourself part of the society, the society that decrees that these are our morals and this is what we're going to act on, and thus people within that society can respond appropriately. But I don't know if maybe that would be legally impossible. I don't know. I'm not trying to judge, but I am trying to point out what potentialities there are. I've been in tricky sponsorship situations too. And this is certainly not the most clear and realistic example of how conflict of interest can be really difficult to deal with. I mean, what if the case is that you're going to get arrested or expelled for the action you're trying to do? What happens when the companies are putting their tendrils into basically every product we consume and enjoy. What happens when the society that we've invested this time and energy in and made all these sacrifices for undermines us in turn, as is the case with many black femmes around the world, including Ella Baker? The answer will never be absolutely universally clear. We will always make mistakes. There will always be gray areas. Um, if you indulge me, I'd like to talk about a particular gray area I've experienced. So I alluded to how I have been in tricky sponsorship situations before. One tricky situation that I haven't told anybody about publicly happened early this year, around January, when I was reached out to by a company that is, okay, they work in mental health services through an app and they are very unpopular for their affiliations and practices. And the money that was put on the table was significant. It was basically like 10 times what I would reasonably expect to make from a sponsorship. And I don't get sponsorships that often in the first place. These were the numbers floated to me. And uh, it was also a precarious time money-wise for me. Now, I'm a very privileged person. I have a lot of things to lean on a lot of people to lean on in situations. I do quite well, so it's not as if I am poor or working class. I have ways that I can say no. And so I said no, because I weighed the, the risk, the reaction that people would have if I pulled up and said, this video is sponsored by blah, blah, blah. And everybody was like, what the fuck? You know, there's a lot of heat towards this. So. In that sense, it was a selfish reaction, right? But also, yeah, it was part of a strategic political action that people are doing where they're trying to boycott that company. And I didn't want to be undermining that. And I've had many conversations with myself about it since then because it's not as if I remedied the financial problems immediately. Like, I've been trying different things, things are going okay, but I still could have really used that money. Not a month goes by where I don't look back and think, damn, I could have used that money. But I didn't take it. And I don't know if that makes me a hero or anything. I, I don't think it does. 
to be clear. I'm sure a lot of people have turned down a lot more. I know that many people have been in much worse situations. But the fact that I am sitting there thinking like, damn, like what if I could have taken some of that money or most of that money and donated it and and, and maybe I could find a way to, to post about it so that people can kind of get the wink, wink, nod that this is why I did this and not undermine the terms of the contract. <sighs> it's, 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 I don't know. You guys let me know. These are things we talk about all the time as YouTubers and uh, especially YouTubers who are trying to do good things with our platform, but also this is our job. And uh, we see the comments. And yeah, sometimes I see the comments that criticize choices I make for money purposes. And, uh, you know, they're not super numerous. I'm very lucky in that way, but they're there. And do they hurt my feelings? A little bit, a little bit, but I would prefer they be there than not because I want to see what people have to say. And there have been times when I've been getting sponsorship deals with a particular company and the money has been consistent. And then people have told me, don't, don't do that company in my comment section, perfect strangers, just alerting me to the practices of that company. And what did I do? I stopped, right? So to some degree, I know what this is about. And that's why when I look at somebody like Hope Situation, somebody who probably had a lot more of an audience than I could reliably look at, it's like, what are you talking about? There's a whole problem that I think we have right now. And I think people think it's parasocial relationships, but it's not. Parasocial relationships are not the problem because y'all act like this in every type of relationship. Y'all act in this particular type of way where because somebody intends well, somebody means well, whatever the fuck that means, that means that they can't be criticized. Even if they're a band or a YouTuber or whatever that has staked their reputation on having good politics and are blatantly denying popular political movements that they should be in affiliation with. People love to defend their individual liberties. They think about that person's emotions. They think about that person's rights to make the choices that are right for them and how we shouldn't judge them and all of that. And a lot of people would say this is parasocial attachment. It stands defending their faves at all costs. And maybe that's true to some degree, but what I really think it is is projection. I really think it's because we're all scared of being called out. We're all scared of being in conflict. We're all scared of what it actually takes to be in solidarity with people. We're scared of confronting the fact that we all fuck up to some degree. And so we dismiss any opportunity to hold people accountable to be better because that would mean that we would have to look at ourselves too. This is why it is dangerous to suggest, as Brittany Broski has, that solidarity costs you nothing. Maybe it costs her nothing, taking deals with Sabra Hummus, you know, not doing specific stuff politically when she, she, I don't know exactly what she's up to now. Maybe she's been in no controversy and it's been totally reformed since then. I know Mario Mirante, the person I almost put in this video at length, was definitely doing the work in terms of talking about what he did wrong to address his bad take. I don't know, it's not about these people as moral people. But solidarity should cost you something. For some people, solidarity costs everything. To say that solidarity isn't hard is to suggest that in a situation when it is hard, that we should get a bailout, we should get an excuse, that we shouldn't even try to do that shit. And in fact, when people call us out for not doing it, that they're the problem because it's hard. Tweeting strongly from our first world homes is not sufficient for us to be in community with the legacies of people for whom solidarity cost far too much. We need and all die, okay? I'm not trying to die. It is true that we can have many nice things while also making some sacrifices. We don't all have to be on the front lines of some revolutionary war. And in fact, most of us shouldn't be, okay? You don't wanna see me try to hold a gun. But it is how one reacts in the face of difficulty, in the face of criticism, that separates their principles from platitudes. When people mock activists for acting in vain, when they mock solidarity for constructing some type of alternative to hegemony, when they lash out at solidarity movements for acting out in ways that upset the order of everyday life, they reveal a deeply held opinion that things should stay the way they are. The thing is, to say you believe in a cause but not in fighting for it is a contradiction. 
To believe in something means believing it is worth fighting for, even if fighting causes pain and damage. What solidarity teaches us is that we can all live in this reality, instead of pretend that there's some perfect alternative means that requires nobody feel uncomfortable at all. So in that case, what is solidarity? Solidarity is sacrifice. It is agreement and disagreement, coalescing in a constantly transforming force against evil. If you believe the world is full of injustices that must be changed, you must believe in solidarity. As DeFord writes, solidarity, if it is about anything, is about the continued hope that things might turn out well. Thanks for watching. Join my Patreon where you can see me have conversations with people like FD Signifier, Saji Sharma, Dr. Fatsma, Ola Sunvia, Noah Samson, Babilla, and so much more. You can also become a channel member and have access to cool emojis on my channel. Thank you all for watching, for making space and time for me, and if you'll excuse me, I need to take a nap because these allergies are beating my ass.